It is Tuesday, May the 19th, and this is Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining the social, economic, and geostrategic concerns in a world ever-changing due to the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Bill Whalen. I'm a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution and the Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Fellow in Journalism. For those of you who have been watching this show, we've been doing this for two months now, I believe, you know the drill, but for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, let me explain what you're about to see. This is a conversation in which three Hoover senior fellows, we like to call them the good fellows, offer their unique insights into what lies ahead in these most uncertain times. Let's meet the good fellows, beginning with John Cochran, an economist at the Hoover Institution's Rosemary and Jack Anderson Senior Fellow. John's also the author of the Grumpy Economist blog, which you should mark as a must read. And it looks like he's also getting into the art business full time. How, how many paintings are behind you today, John? Uh, let's see. Today we have a group of, you can count them as fast as I can, seven, uh, all with scientific themes involving food, which is why we're in my dining room. <laughs> There's a theme to this. Very good. We're also graced by the presence of Neil Ferguson, the Hoover Institution's Milbank Family Senior Fellow. Neil's also a renowned historian and author. He's also the host of Neil Ferguson's Networld, a three-part PBS series on the intersection of social media, technology, and the spread of cultural movements. Neil, the question most viewers who watched last week want to know, did you reach a happy intersection? Did you and the woodpecker come to some sort of mutual agreement? Well, we, uh, we reached uh, detente, I think, rather than full-blown peace. Uh, a neighbor explained to me that the woodpeckers hate very bright light, and so I pinned some tinfoil up on the, uh, the, the p place they've been drilling, and it, it has worked pretty well. Having said that, I'm almost sure they'll start another attack now that we're recording this, uh, this show. So unfortunately, I don't have my gun handy this time. So if they, if they do, I'll probably just have to climb out on the roof and, and negotiate. Well, if cartoons have taught us anything, woodpeckers are just really annoying creatures. There are worse, you know, there are the rock chucks. I, 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 Montana is just uh, really like being on safari. And the, uh, the latest uh, uh, assailant of the Ferguson household is the rock chuck, a rather large and quite agreeable looking rodent that uh, <laughs> prefers living under one's house. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you more if you're interested about my war against the rock chucks. Speaking of war, that leads us to our third and final good fellow, last but certainly not least, and that is Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. He is the Hoover Institution's Fawad and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow. Prior to coming back to the Hoover Institution, H.R. was a security fellow uh, years ago. H.R. Uh, McMaster was the National Security Advisor to the President of the United States. He is also the author of a book coming up soon, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. It's coming out this fall, but you can pre-order it right now. Hello, H.R., how are you today? Good, Bill. Good to be with you. So I'd like to begin this show a little differently. We tend to run out of time. The internet gods give us only so much time to talk and time seems to go by fast with you good fellows. So I'd like to cut to the end of the broadcast today and introduce a light segment. And that is the question of cocktails and libations in these times. And let me kick this off. I have a routine now. I go for a walk at the end of the day around sunset. And what I'm gonna do today is probably pre-pour this guy. This is Manhattan premix. It's I know I know there are people who like to go through an extravagant process of cocktails, but I'm sorry, life is short, time is short, and so I just as soon pour this into this little red solo cup yonder here. Drop a couple of ice cubes, a couple of maraschino cherries, and I'm good to go. So HR, why don't you start this off? What what would you recommend these days? What was your cocktail of choice? What do you what do you find comfort in? Well, I'm, I'm sure that like a lot of people, dinner's kind of a, a ritual, right? And, and gosh, my wife, Katie's doing, doing an amazing job every night, something different, and we're planning it and talking about what's, what we're going to have next, and occasionally I have barbecue. We're also very fortunate, as I mentioned, to have my daughter, son-in-law, and eight-month-old twin grandsons with us as, as well. So our schedule revolves around their bedtime. As they're getting ready for bed, I go down into the cellar and, and pull out some Pinot Noir, which I, which I prefer. I love California Pinot Noirs. I, I'm partial to those from the San Ynez Valley. Uh, but I would like to just highlight one in particular that I think everybody should, should be enthusiastic about because it's, it goes with the theme of this, uh, of this show. And, and it's called Land of Promise. The founder, uh, uh, Diana Karen, is she is, a, she is an immigrant and she's extremely patriotic. She is a naturalized citizen like our colleague, Neil. And, and, uh, and in, in her wines, she celebrates the United States. And so it's patriotic themed and it's very good Pinot Noir from S Sonoma Coast in, in this case. All right, John Cochran, you're an exceptionally healthy person. Is this a conversation you wanna be a part of? 
Well, I used to be a part of it, but I'll have to admit about a year and a half ago, I stopped drinking. And uh, I have very sad news for my federal middle-aged men. You sleep a lot better and uh, you get up easier the next morning if you're not enjoying those wonderful California Cabernets that I used to enjoy. So these evenings we're, we do sort of a, uh, a, a very interesting mocktail uh, before our also uh, somewhat more extravagant dinners, which is how we entertain ourselves these days. Okay, for the record, you're not calling for a return of the Volstead Act. Nope, I'm a libertarian. Do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's turn to the international man of history and get his thoughts. My first question, Neil, since you are a citizen of the world, uh, is it five o'clock where you currently are, or is five o'clock sort of a, shall we say, a floating principle with you? Well, it tends to be six o'clock. Uh, in the Ferguson clan, and it's always six o'clock somewhere. Look, I have bad news for you, John. You, you won't live longer. It'll just seem longer. Uh, <laughs> Winston Churchill is my, uh, my guide on all matters alcoholic. Churchill was, was once asked by a young aspirant politician if he had any advice to impart, and, and Churchill replied with the immortal words, drink steadily. I've, I've not begun drinking steadily Today, it's still only the afternoon here in, in Montana, and uh, it's a good rule not, not to drink and go on onto webcasts or live TV for that matter. But I, I, I'd like to just, you know, break a lance for the drink of the people, beer. Um, I like to end the day with a beer, and it, it's the sort of moment when I, I start to unwind and become a little bit easier to live with. Montana has uh, a plethora of terrific breweries, and I recently discovered Bent Nail, an extremely fine, uh, a very fine ale, uh, which invites lots of humorous puns from my family about Bent Neal. <laughs> uh, Neil uh, Churchill was famous for champagne consumption. Was it Palms? Was that the uh, champagne that he had? Uh, brandy, scotch during the day. I don't recall Churchill drinking beer, do you? Uh, I'm sure he managed at least some beer in his early uh, career. In fact, it was right. probably compulsory at Harrow when he was a boy there. And surely when he was in the military, there'll have been some beer consumed. But I, re I refer you to our colleague, Andrew Roberts, whose wonderful biography of Churchill published last year lays to rest uh, the myth that Churchill was a drunk, uh, something that German wartime propaganda used to insist. The key with Churchill, Andrew, shows is that he drank steadily, but was hardly ever inebriated. And that's what we should all, I think, aspire to. Well, where I grew up in, in Glasgow, uh, there was this kind of curious uh, snobbery. You had to be able to drink a colossal amount of alcohol, but remain apparently sober. And uh, I do think that's a, an ideal, an ideal uh, that, John, you should, you should consider returning to strive for. All right. Well, let us move on with the show today. And last week I asked you a very simple question, which was, what would you do? And I thought we had a very good conversation based on that. So I want to throw another simple question at you. And I'm about to put you into a very alternate universe, one in which the three good fellows are in charge of the United States federal government. And I want to be clear, this is not a dictatorship. Um, this is not a junta. You are duly elected officials. Neil will have to fiddle out the Constitution, but we can get that done. So either one of you runs the government or the three of you run the government. But here's what I want you to get into today. So much time and effort is spent right now revisiting choices of the past few months. Uh, uh, I find it very frustrating. It's revisionism. It's armchair quarterbacking. You can't undo the past. I think for the purposes of the show, let's talk about instead of what should not have been done, let's talk about what should be, uh, what should be done instead. Let's talk about economically, John Cochran, what should be done, HR, geostrategically, what should be done. Neil, why don't you start this off? Uh, what should be done in terms of preparing for pandemic wave number two? Well, this is uh, uh, an exciting opportunity. As a keen student of ancient Roman history, I've always wanted to be in a triumvirate, though they, they didn't last terribly long and usually ended rather badly for two out of three members of the triumvirate. Still, this is a reasonable question to ask. After all, the history of nearly all republics has ended in empire uh, in some form of, of tyranny. And as, as someone who has long thought about uh, America's imperial predicament, 
I don't think this is quite as fanciful a question as you pose, because the pandemic has revealed a terrible pathology at the heart of um, American political life, and it's not the one you think. Uh, while the media endlessly pour over the every utterance of, of President Trump, the real pathology that the pandemic has exposed is that we have a completely dysfunctional administrative state that is extremely good at generating PowerPoints and multiple page reports, but when it comes to actually dealing with an emergency, is completely useless. And it has been brought home forcefully to me that it wasn't always so. I've just been reading up the history of how the federal government, then a much smaller entity with many fewer people working for it and a much smaller budget, dealt really pretty easily with the pandemic of influenza in 1957-58. So I propose that our triumvirate do a couple of things, uh, one which will be for the short term, one for the long term. The short-term thing is that we need to, uh, as far, fast as possible, get rid of impediments to people returning to work and indeed to normal life insofar as it's compatible with a, an infectious new pathogen. And the way in which we can expedite that, uh, and here I'm going to go against uh, some conventional wisdom, is indeed to learn from our friends in Taiwan and South Korea and combine, uh, integrate, in fact, testing and contact tracing so that we can much more efficiently play that game of whack-a-mole that we're going to be playing for the foreseeable future until finally there's a vaccine. So let's just get that done. We have the technology, we have the capability, and we have the templates. We can do this without fundamentally compromising the, the privacy of individuals. We know that because the Taiwanese have shown how to do it. That's the short-term uh, uh, first thing to do. Second thing is, I think we need to undertake a radical reform of the federal government itself, and we need to shrink it. We need to look at all the superfluous agencies and departments and undersecretaries and assistant secretaries, and we need to ask, are you in fact necessary? And it seems to me that we should take a leaf out of the book of my friend and fellow Oxford historian Dominic Cummings, who was planning to undertake just that kind of root and branch reform of the British government. That was actually what he was about to do when along came a pandemic and exposed that, yep, the British government is just about as dysfunctional as the American government. So I hope my fellow uh, members of the Triumvirate are on board with these two measures, because if not, you know what happens. John H.R.? I'll, I'll chime in. Uh, I think this is going to be a happy triumvirate, and maybe I'll start drinking again if, uh, if this goes well. You'll have to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or I'll wait till you guys are soused and do you in. Um, <laughs> yes, drink, the number one thing... Never drunk, are, remember, John. Uh, the number one thing I would do is, uh, is get the heck out of the way. Um, and I'm, I'm even trying to be realistic here. What can an executive do on his own? Uh, I would allow anybody who wants to sell a face mask in the United States to produce and sell a face mask. And you don't need to wait a month for approval from the FDA to be allowed to sell a 50 cent piece of plastic uh, that, that helps people. Um, testing, you wanna sell tests to the United States public? Do it, free market testing. You, you can order it on Amazon, go home. You don't need to have it approved, have your doctor approve you and refer you to it and argue about who's pay, paying for it. Um, Vaccine, uh, 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 the WHO was in the news today. The one thing everyone can agree upon is that a vaccine, when it comes, can't possibly be sold for profit. Heavens no, it must be owned by the world as a whole. So I would decree that anybody who comes up with a vaccine can charge any price they want for it. They can sell it to anyone they want to. And that the discipline on this will be the competition from the other 100 people who are going to get a vaccine. Uh, more, more generally, uh, there sh I would uh, immediately pass a federal override on all price gouging regulations of all sorts. Uh, sell what you want at what price you want. We're going to have property rights in this darn country and incentives to provide stuff in, in shortages. Um, I would put uh, testing is important. I would, I would allocate $100 billion of federal money. I mean, come on, guys, we're spending trillions, doesn't matter. And put Paul Romer in charge of the supply tests to everybody department of the federal government uh, and get that going. That is, I think, in the short run, the, uh, he's, he's right. Um, 
Now, as, as Neil points out, we don't have the bureaucratic capacity to do anything with tests. So we just have to flood the market with tests, which by the way, you can buy Amazon comes right in. They don't have to be perfect. Uh, the news that Abbott got shut down because it had some false positives. You know, what the hell? Uh, you, what you want is spit in a cup tests, which the FDA is still not allowing people to use the spit in the cup tests for reasons I don't know. It, it, it turns out it's the same guy at the FDA who makes a point out of driving 55 miles an hour in the left lane around DC just to make a point about people speeding who is not allowing them to uh, spit in cups. I hope I got that story right, but it's a great story in any case. Um, yes, um, we need the adaptability to, to, to get the economy going again. No, we do not need another $5 trillion of printed money. We need to get the regulatory state out of the way. I hope that the snafus involving this uh, uh, pandemic will become a lesson. I doubt that they will, but that, that is, we, we are overstuffed with red tape and that's why we're not, we're not growing. And then yes, to, um, <clears throat> this is gonna be a happy triumvirate. Our, we need to restore the, the basic competence of the bureaucratic states so that we have public, a public health system that's ready to go. It, I'm shocked that lockdowns are becoming the policy tool that everybody talks about. Lockdowns are economic lockdowns, are the last panic button that you do when nothing else is working. Uh, we need a competent test, trace, whatever the technology allows you, to a public health system that allows you to, to tamp out um, viruses quickly, jump on them quickly, detect them quickly. Uh, this is not the president. This is not, the president himself does not sit at the airport and scan people's foreheads and find out if they've got, if they've got uh, fevers or not. You need a, a well-oiled, low-level bureaucracy to do this kind of stuff. And it's just shocking that we don't have one. And so uh, the triumvirate will put one in place as fast as possible. So HR, so far the triumvirate works because you have one partner who is very busy trying to solve health problems. The other one is tilting at the windmill that is bureaucracy and trying to make more sense and a more laissez-faire government. They have left the world at your feet. So let's talk about what the triumvirate does in terms of foreign policy and the world beyond our shores. Well, first I'll just pick up on the theme of, of, of competence. And we have, to, we have to have a competent response to a whole range of, of challenges and opportunities. And I think we ought to take advantage of this crisis and learn from what were failures in, in implementation in, in key areas. And I think what also we have to, we've learned is that we need an integrated response, an integrated response across the various departments and agencies that Neil made a good case for trimming down. Uh, but then also we need an integrated response between levels of government what happens at the county level? What happens at the state level? What are the responsibilities at, at the federal level? And then a coordinated response, as, as we've seen, of one of the most effective aspects of coping with this is the degree to which the private sector can contribute uh, to, uh, to mobilizing uh, resources in, in response to the, to the conflict or to the, to the crisis. So I, I think in terms of government competence, I would emphasize coordination and integration of efforts. And there are some specific, some specific aspects to this, right? Is, is that you have to have some visibility, right? You have to be able to, to see across hospitals, for example, to see how many beds and ICU beds and ventilators and, and stockages of, of PPE are, are, are available. You have to have visibility of, of who are the people who could be mobilized and employed in, in advance of a wave of, of a pandemic. So you have the right people with the right specialties there uh, to, to respond to it. And so I, I think that there's going to be a lot of work uh, with an emphasis on this coordination and integration across levels of government, across departments and, and agencies. And I think this will be an important aspect of the, of the response. And what you're alluding to, though, Bill, is, is from a foreign policy perspective, we have to come out of, out of this ready to compete compete from a strategic perspective, compete from a foreign policy perspective and an econ economic uh, perspective. And I think what you're seeing playing out at the WHO this week is that China is taking advantage of this opportunity to try to advance the narrative of the Chinese Communist Party, as well as advance its authoritarian statist economic model as a model that works, right? China did this well, democracies didn't do this well. First of all, I think that's a lot of bunk because it's asking you to believe uh, what the information that comes out of China. And I think it undersells, right? It undersells the advantages of our free and open societies 
when coping with any crisis, right? And, and, and this is, these are some of the themes that we've spoken about on Goodfellows is the importance of, uh, of our ability to criticize our government, our, our, the ability of our citizens to get involved in this kind of a reform effort and, and, and how we come out of this crisis e- even stronger. So the final aspect of this that I would highlight then is that we, we, have, to try to, we have to try to make our whole society stronger on, on the back end of this. And, and this would involve, I think, you know, education, as we had discussed in, in, the, in the, last, uh, the last session. Uh, I, but I think I, today I'd like to, to maybe emphasize civics education to understand better really the gift of our free market economic system uh, as well as our free and open democratic uh, system of, of governance. Mm-hmm. And, and this has a lot to do with political culture. And maybe we can all begin to voice uh, intolerance for a continuation of the vitriolic partisan politics that we witness and roll our sleeves up and get to work. I mean, there's a lot of work to, to be done, uh, as, as John and Neil have, have pointed out, in, in the area of the strength of our economic system uh, and in governance. And there's a lot of work to be done internationally, uh, along with like, like-minded partners. I sense an opportunity here, right? I, I sense that there is a recognition that the way that this, that this, this pandemic developed uh, could only occur uh, really with, within that closed authoritarian system uh, and, and, and within the policies of the Chinese Communist Party. Hey, if you think you know, authoritarian governments do a great job with this, I guess if you believe North Korea that they don't even have one case, you can believe that. Right? <laughs> or, uh, but you could also look at, at Iran as another example where it's been utterly, utterly mishandled. Uh, Venezuela, another case. I mean, hospitals in Venezuela don't have soap. Right. I mean, so so if you if you want to extol the virtues of socialism, there are some great models to look at uh, these days. And I, I think what we, we need to come out of this with is, as I mentioned at the beginning, a higher degree of competence. But we need to come out of this with a higher degree of confidence, a, th- a theme that we've taught talked about across these these episodes as well. Mm-hmm. Gentlemen, Neil, John. Oh, well, I was going to ask HR a question. I was politely waiting for you, Bill, to take us forward, but uh, no need for politeness. Uh, Pass me a can of bent nail. Um, I've been reading uh, Christian Brose's new book, uh, which uh, alarmingly argues that the United States is not, in fact, ready for prime time in the event of a conventional conflict with China. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he makes the argument that, that this is not for want of technological prowess, but simply because we weighed down with uh, with legacy military capabilities that have political uh, vested interests supporting them in Congress. Now, uh, as soon as I read this, I thought, I need to ask my friend HR if it's as bad as this, and, and if it is, what we, the triumvirate, are going to do about it. Because I'd like to make a, a suggestion that that's a little novel in the context of Goodfellows. We talked a lot about Cold War with China over the last weeks, and gosh, it turns out to be months. Um, time flies when you're enjoying yourself in a pandemic. But, but what about hot war? One of the things that hit me last week uh, in the course of a conversation with a friend is that everything is happening much faster than it did in the 1930s. We're doing the Great Depression, but what used to take a year takes a month. It's a kind of high speed early 1930s. But that might mean that we get to 1939 or 1941 rather faster than we expect. So I guess my question for you, HR, is A, uh, is Christian Bros right? And B, could we find ourselves confronting a military showdown much sooner than we expect because China and I think Russia have incentives to take advantage of this moment of supreme American weakness. Let me, let me jump in on the question, but before HR gets the answer, because we talked about this earlier and I was also following this story this year. And just for our listeners who may not be up on exactly what's in this book, uh, apparently a lot of recent war games, uh, US versus China, the US loses fast. And some of the mechanisms are, you know, we have these beautiful aircraft carriers. They have missiles, boom, they sink the aircraft carriers or we take them back. Uh, they strike our bases or we empty the bases out. Uh, they take down our satellites, our communication, and we, we don't lose the war in the sense they invade San Francisco, but they certainly take over Taiwan and there's nothing uh, we can do about it. And there is a good analogy here. Uh, the U.S. was mighty unprepared for World War II for much of the same reasons. Uh, with some exceptions like like the gorgeous B-17, but with many exceptions, our weapons were just, they were designed for uh, political connections, not to actually fight wars. 
Uh, so um, with that extra background, let me pass it on to HR for, uh, are we in deep trouble? Uh, are we unprepared there as we were for the pandemic? Well, you know, we're, we're facing a situation in which we have a significant bow wave of deferred modernization across all services. And I think we also are dealing with decisions that have been made previously that I think overemphasized fewer and fewer more exquisite systems rather than a larger number of less exquisite but effective systems that are better insulated and protected against a uh, sort of catastrophic failure based on countermeasures that we see Russia and, and China developing. I'm not, I don't want to go back into deep history, <laughs> but a lot of, a lot of, the, uh, a, a lot of the, the gaps in the capabilities we would like to have goes, go back to the 1991 Gulf War and the, and the, and the uh, sort of the overwhelming military victory over the sixth largest army in the world, Saddam, Hussein, Saddam Hussein's army, and the wrong lessons that came out of that. The, the lesson was that American technological pr prowess would ensure that future wars would be fast, cheap, and efficient. Yeah, like, and like the Gulf, Gulf War uh, and ended in decisive victory. But we forgot a couple of things, right? First of all, there are two ways to fight the U.S. military, asymmetrically and stupidly, right? And you want your, your enemy to pick stupidly, but they're, uh, they're, they're likely to learn vicariously from those who you beat up on, like the Iraqi army in 1991, and apply asymmetric uh, tactics, techniques, operational concepts, but, and also develop asymmetric capabilities, China studied the Gulf War very, very closely, and so did Russia, even though you know, Russia was reeling from the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s. And what they decided to do is, hey, we're not going to mirror image the United States military's joint force capabilities. What we're going to do instead is figure out how we can take them apart. And they began to develop a range of capabilities that just made it a heck of a lot more difficult for us to, to play our A game as a joint force. And this involved, for example, uh, sophisticated electronic warfare capabilities, counter-satellite capabilities, offensive cyber capabilities, long-range missiles, tiered and layered air defense, uh, investment in drones and, 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 uh, and, and autonomous uh, systems, uh, lots of submarines uh, for, for, the, for the Chinese. And so, so th what we have to do now is adjust our defense strategy to cope with a realization that the assumption we made in the past is that a smaller and smaller and more exquisite force could have a greater and greater impact militarily over a wider area. That's no longer the case. And I think what this puts a premium on, a premium on this situation is real joint capabilities, complementary air, sea, maritime, space, cyberspace, because ultimately, you know what war is? War is rock, paper, scissors, right? If your enemy shows up with rock, you better have paper, scissors, and you have to use all these capabilities in combination. There's never going to be a silver bullet in war. Right? You have the submarine, the sonar, the bomber, the radar, the machine gun, the tank, the tank, the anti-tank missile. So it's really how you combine capabilities in a joint force. I believe that China's and Russia's so-called anti-access area denial capabilities puts a premium on capable forward positioned joint forces and puts a premium on our allied capabilities. If you want to deny the, 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 U, the U.S. military access? Well, you can't if you have a forward position force there because the forward position force turns that so-called denied space into contested space from the beginning. And so what we really want to do is deter the kind of cataclysmic conflict that, would, that, that, we, we, would, that we would risk uh, if we were to go to war with China and Russia. We want to convince the leaders of Russia and China that they cannot accomplish their objectives uh, through the use of force. So... <laughs> I think that we, we need a, a new modernization approach that has a better a better balance between between the, the, the sort of the the, uh, uh, the 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 capabilities the of the force and the capacity the size of the forces reemphasizes the importance of forward position joint forces and, and and the alliances that give us tremendous capability and we have to demonstrate that capability and we have to have the will to use it if necessary. Uh, but but I think that Chris Chris Bros, who I know very well, I'm sure it's an excellent book. It's on order. I haven't received it yet. <laughs> but uh, but but I I imagine this is the type of argument he's going to make. 
And, uh, and, and I think we would do well to, to heed much of his advice and to think more clearly uh, ab about really how these adversaries view future armed conflict, because war is interactive <laughs> within the war. And then, and then, of course, militaries interact in between wars to try to gain a differential advantage over each other. And so I, I don't think we're, we're, in a, we're not in a desperate situation. We have a highly capable joint force. I mean, if aircraft carriers can't get in, you have land-based aircraft, you have aerial refueling capabilities, you have long-range missile capabilities, you have a, a suite of, of capabilities. I would say one thing against conventional wisdom here, though, is that I think close combat may be becoming more and more likely. The, the trend has been, hey, let's get further away. And this is really, it, it's really a version of strategic bombing theory that appears in a new guise like every 10 years. <laughs> really, really the next war will be at standoff range and, and waged quickly, cheaply, and, and efficiently through some kind of a targeting process. And, and, I, and I think that's not the case because of the countermeasures our adversaries are, are employing. I mean, I think a historical analogy, Neil, is the V1 and V2 threat to London in World War II, which were in many ways kind of the, you know, the first drones uh, and, and, uh, and the only way they were defeated was to overrun that territory. I, and I think that th th it is also analogous to the Scud missile threat, for example, from, uh, from, uh, from Iraq in the 1991 Gulf War, the, the threat that, and the missiles that were fired at Israel. We couldn't, we couldn't really find them until we got on the ground. It's analogous to the 2006 war in southern Lebanon, when the Israeli Defense Force, with a tremendous range of capabilities, were unable to, to, to destroy those rockets until they, they got on the ground and rooted them out. Now, I, you know, I, I'm not saying that you need a, a huge army to do that, but it concerns me, you know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm an armored cavalry guy, but when the, U, when the U.S. Marine Corps is giving up their tanks, I'm thinking, what are you doing? You know, I think, I think close combat uh, is a competency we need uh, to deter comp conflict, but, and then also to respond uh, in a way that overmatches an enemy in future war. Can I do another reading recommendation while we're uh, waiting for uh, uh, Chris Brose's book to arrive? Uh, uh, for some time now, people in the, in the military have been enthusing to me about a, a fictional work, uh, Ghost Fleet, a novel of the next world war. I'm going to get the author's names right, P.W. Singer and August Cole. Uh, I don't know if you've read it, HR, but it seems like every military person I run across has read it, and I've been reading it, uh, partly because I have an appetite for, for science fiction, anything that tries to think about the future, but, but also because it goes right to the heart of what we're discussing. It, it envisages a, a very high-tech surprise strike uh, on U.S. Uh, defense capabilities in, in all domains. And for me, the most impressive thing about the book is uh, the way in which it, it drills down into how an all-out cyber-based uh, war would be waged. And, and, and the challenge in war, this is a key lesson of history, is always trying to visualize the next war and liberate yourself from the assumptions of the last one. I don't know, HR, if, it's, if, if, if you have a view on that book, but I certainly found it very illuminating. Right. It, it, it's, an, it's an excellent book, I think. Uh, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of like the last few chapters, which was really interesting, that played out in Hawaii. But one of the, one of the, one of the, uh, the themes in the book is, is how exquisite technologies failed catastrophically. And so what happens is, is right, up, right up here in San Francisco Bay, they activated an old an old Navy destroyer and bring back some old crusty sea dogs, you know, sailors to get on there and <laughs> figure out how to work all the old machinery. But that, but it, but it's it, that, that capability survives, right? Because it can degrade much like re remember when the, the Russians attacked Ukraine, Ukraine's uh, electrical system, <laughs> because it was old, you know, somebody could go in the back room and flick the switch back on. Of course, of course, in our advanced digital systems, you, you can't, you can't do that anymore. Wait, sure. But it's, it is, it's an excellent book. It's a fun read as well. You haven't painted a great picture that, <laughs> you know, China invades Taiwan or, or denies shipping through the South China Sea. And you said, well, what we got to do is, uh, uh, you know, 1944, a Normandy invasion of China runs some tanks over to find where their missiles are coming from. That doesn't sound like a great plan. Well, no, it's, well, that's not that's not what that's not what it meant. <laughs> you're not but, asking, I hope not, <laughs> hey, John. You're not asking HR to reveal what the real plan is. I don't think he should do that. Not on this show. No, no you need. Well, I just like to know there is. No, you need you need complimentary. Yeah. I meant by rock paper. Scissors. 
right? Is you need you need complementary air, uh, maritime, space, and cyberspace capabilities that can all be employed together. Now the the doctrine that that I was working on in the Army and has now been it's been adopted by the Joint Force is called multi-domain operations or multi-domain battle, and I think it's right. Okay, and and I, so I think conceptually the joint forces is, is on the right path. And essentially what they're saying is because we will be contested in all these domains, we have to have capabilities in each of those domains that can be projected into the other domain to create windows of opportunity, right? For, for, for maneuver and to seize and maintain the initiative. I, and think, I, presume, I, I presume. think that's right. I think that's right. And I think I'm a big fan of decentralization of these capabilities because I think complexity theory works here, right? As well, when you have a when you, when you have an incredibly complex and unpredictable, uh, unpredictable system, what you do is try to bound that complexity by giving organizations a portion of that problem and giving them the assets that they that they that they can use uh, to to to, uh, to cope with that complexity. So I think that we, what we should see is more and more decentralized joint capabilities complementary capabilities that can be used in in this combination of rock paper scissors and uh and and i think we have to design systems that that degrade gracefully and we're going to require greater capacity now that capacity you can get a number of ways it's numbers of people numbers of fighter squadrons but it but it could be this combination of manned and unmanned systems as well now, I presume a little bit of deterrence uh, is, is part of it. In other words, yeah, you can take down our satellites, but we can take down your satellites too. Right. And uh, why don't you not cross that boundary? Uh, and this is where alliances are so important too, right? I mean, so if, you, if, 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 uh, if an adversary tries to take down your satellite, but you have capacity that you use on a French satellite, are they going to go to war with France too? Are they going to go to war with fill-in-the-blank country? And so I think like-minded countries in alliances and partnerships – serve as a very important deterrent uh, in space and, and, and in cyberspace, in much in the way as they have physically uh, through, you know, the, the deterrent efforts in, in Europe over the years, uh, over, the, over the Cold War. Can I raise a question to my fellow triumvirate members? Uh, it came up actually in our last conversation, but we didn't really have time to get into it. And that is the, the information warfare. Ah, I'm going to turn to this too. Good. Because it, it, it seems to me, if we look back over 10 years, that the US military had a kind of cyber warfare uh, strategy, uh, but it didn't really have an information warfare strategy. We were kind of looking uh, for attacks on critical infrastructure. What we got was memes from the Internet Research Agency in Russia that caused considerable confusion uh, in the political process back in 2016. And right now, it seems to me like the Chinese have already started their information warfare. Uh, they're busily using uh, every p potential media channel to communicate their, their message that uh, not only was the pandemic not their fault, but they're actually the solution to the rest of the world's problems. So it seems to me that if, if that's the face of, of war, or at least an important face of war, we have a problem because it's not at all clear how an open society that is committed to free speech does defense against information warfare waged by an adversary that is not an open society. There sure isn't any deterrence in info wars. What are we going to do? Try and send memes into the Chinese internet? That's not going to work. So, I mean, John, I know you're a kind of uh, free speech fundamentalist, and I think I am too. And I think we were beginning to kind of draw up some uh, adversarial positions last time. But, but you must have some answer to the question, what do we do about information warfare? Because it's happening. Well, let's play, it's not so much the warfare as the, uh, there's the battle of ideologies, which is the short of warfare. Uh, I think not, not just while they're trying to shoot up the uh, Taiwan Strait, but uh, the, what's going on exactly right now. But let me broaden that question. The, the one wonderful thing about the U.S. response to the virus so far has been our free and open internet, by which all of us can read scientific studies in real time, comment on them. A community of people instantly tears apart. Somebody says, oh, this works. A community of people within three days tears apart the study, no, it doesn't work, and, and we all proceed that way. Uh, our experts have been wrong many times over, uh, found to be wrong by people on the internet, and then the experts change their minds. Just look at the recommendations on face masks for the most obvious thing. Uh, 
the the information about how to fight this disease has been uh, you know zooming around the U.S. internet, uh, not through official channels. How are doctors figuring out how to treat this thing? Not through the CDC, thank you very much, but just by the the unfiltered Twitter and so forth. So the saddest news I've seen in the last week is that uh, Twitter, Google, Facebook, they are all censoring. And they are all, YouTube, Google announced that um, YouTube is going to be pulling down uh, videos that, that, and, and, or flagging things that it says disagree with official uh, advice. And official advice meant the WHO. So Google is now going to be censoring things that disagree with the WHO's advice. Uh, Twitter did, uh, did similar things. Um, and in my view, uh, since the, so I'll turn it back to you, Neil, what do you want to do about this? So government, uh, privately regulated censorship is a terrible idea. Uh, let's remember where we are on the political spectrum and whose idea of fake news is. Uh, once the internet gets, uh, gets censored, all of us are going to be branded fake news instantly because we go against official guidelines. Uh, you know, that's all about the monopoly of information for who's in power. So I see uh, the, the only response I can see to this is that you want more official regulation and censorship of the internet. And that I think would be an absolute disaster. The answer to information is more free information. You know, back in the era when things was printed, all sorts of fake news was sent about by pamphlets in 1790. And what did we do? Well, people ran contrary pamphlets. Uh, the amount of fake news even spread in the last election was from abroad was tiny compared to the fake news generated happily by our own citizens. So I, I think it's a mistake to focus on the, the geostrategic part of the fake news. There's plenty of it domestically. And it's a mistake. The only, uh, what response do you have other than uh, government control and censorship of the internet or private control and censorship of the internet, which is going to be about people who have a political view fundamentally opposed to ours and think we are fake news that needs to be stamped out. Well, bad news, John. It's been the case for some time that the, uh, the, the tech companies have engaged in censorship. It, 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 it's, uh, it's actually been going on for years, and, and they do it in subtle ways. It's perhaps a little bit more obvious now in the midst of the pandemic. But in reality, uh, there's been a, a whole range of ways in which uh, the big tech companies have, have gone far beyond the requirements uh, we had requirements on child pornography and terrorism, but they went beyond that in their uh, their conditions of use, and they uh, and, and and they they haven't really been checked in that respect. We 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 basically f did nothing after the uh, the crisis of 2016. There was some uh, signalling of intent to reform from Silicon Valley. Uh, and then Congress was uh, distracted by the idea of antitrust actions, a complete uh, cul-de-sac in my view. So I did a paper on, on this, gosh, it must be two years ago now for Hoover, uh, uh, answering precisely the question you've asked, what have you got other than more censorship or government regulation? And, and here's the answer. Uh, we need to do two things. Uh, the internet companies, the big dominant tech companies, have almost complete protection from liability under a Catch-22 piece of legislation, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, a mid-1990s uh, piece of legislation dreamt up when the tiny little fledgling companies in garages were trying to get going. These are now the biggest corporations in the world, and they are essentially protected from any serious litigation uh, arising from harms that can be attributed uh, to their, uh, their operation as, uh, as, as platforms. So that's part one, that they just need to be more liable to, to legal action by us as citizens, which they're not at the moment. The second thing we need to do is to create a quasi First Amendment for cyberspace. I say quasi because obviously the First Amendment isn't something that really applies to private entities, nor should it. But I remember Joe Nye saying to me that at Harvard, the principle was that you should act as if the First Amendment applied on campus. And I think we should act as if the First Amendment exists 
posts on the internet. So you should be able to sue uh, Google if it censors you. Uh, I'd just like to make these big corporations, the largest and most profitable in America, liable and accountable to us as citizens. Uh, we don't need censorship. Couldn't agree with you more. In fact, we should push back against it. Uh, and we also don't need to be in a situation in which the, the uh, network platforms can host fake content from Russia, China, or anywhere else that gives rise to harms, leads to uh, threats of death that are actually might be carried out. There's no legal recourse. And the amazing thing is that we have an entire body of law that goes back around about a century to the First World War, which stakes out what exactly free speech means in, an Amer in America and what the limits are to it, because there is a, a limit. You can't just go online and threaten to kill, say, Ayan Hirsi Ali, whom I happen to be married to. But we don't apply these sound legal principles to the internet. And, and I think that's, that's a travesty. And I'm afraid, going back to our earlier conversation with HR, we have created a huge vulnerability. I don't agree with you that Russian intervention was trivial and inconsequential. It's true that only 1% of uh, political content came from the Russians, but it was seen by almost everybody who voted in the 2016 election. It may not have decided of the election, but it cannot be healthy that a foreign power can introduce into our body politic content that purports to be by Americans and get away with it. And so did the platforms. They got away with it. Nobody's been held to account for any of that, as far as I can see. In fact, it's business as usual at Facebook and Google and Apple. And let me just end my tirade with one final point. We started this conversation by talking about contact tracing. No companies in the world are better placed to carry out a systematic and efficient system of contact tracing than the big tech companies of Silicon Valley. And yet, here we are in mid-May, and we are still nowhere near having the kind of app that exists in countries like Taiwan and South Korea that would allow us actually to take advantage of all the data that these companies have gathered. And as far as I can see, they are dragging their feet because the bureaucrats that now run those corporations think it's too risky to get into the contact tracing business because there might be blowback. Back. So here we are in a really ghastly predicament, huge companies that dominate the public sphere that we haven't worked out how to regulate, that essentially are a battle space for our enemies to wage information warfare, and they can't even be bothered to help us combat this pandemic. I think it's scandalous. Well, wait, it's not that they can't, it can't be bothered. So I'm with you on the First Amendment and, and that the reply to bad speech is more speech. I, I will say that um, you come from a civilized country and you haven't been an American long enough if you think the answer is to unleash our body of liability lawyers uh, on anything, um, instantly they will sue, oh, Trump said he drank chloroquine. That might induce somebody some harm. Sue in federal court, national injunction. Uh, unleashing the lawyers on them strikes me as, as, as not a very uh, functional way to do it. And in fact, why are the tech companies not re re releasing apps that allow contact tracing? Because they're scared to death of getting sued over uh, over the privacy violations and so forth that happens. So I'm, I'm halfway with you there. And, and maybe I'll let HR get a, a moment in on this. One. Actually, we're actually starting to run out of time here. I want to get HR in. So HR has been noticeably quiet the past few minutes. And this is how you achieve power. You let your rivals quarrel and let them eventually fight and you just quietly step in the vacuum. So bravo, General McMaster. Uh, let's close with a thought here, HR. I want you to walk with this. Um, Neil is uh, presenting a paper on uh, the pandemic of the late 1950s, the, the Hong Kong flu, the Asian flu. Um, the President of the United States at that time would have been an Army General. One more star than you. He had five, you have four. Let's talk a bit about the bully pulpit. Let's close out with this. HR, I think you could put on that full dress uniform of yours, the one that's on the cover of your book, and you would have my attention. And I pretty much do what you told me because that is authority. But in terms of the day and age, the triumvirate, how would the three of you use the bully pulpit of the office? More communication, less communication? Tell me exactly how you do it. Well, I, I think communication, it aims at restoring our confidence in who we are as a people to encourage really Americans to restore faith in their government by demonstrating competence, first of all, but then also by appealing for us to stop kind of the vitriolic discourse that we're engaged in and to focus on common problems. I think what's really regrettable these days, and I've said this a couple of times, and hopefully I'm not making, I'm not becoming tiresome, is that, you know, I think we never, we never get to what we can agree on. And we do agree on quite a bit. And, and, that, and that, could be, that could be sufficient enough for us to establish a, an important agenda in the areas that we've talked about, you know, in, in, in Goodfellows and in, in the areas of, of education, uh, in the areas of 
preparing for, for the next sort of the crisis or our next uh, pandemic in the areas of defense. But I, I really am concerned broadly, I guess, what I would call the, our political culture. And I would try to, to, to get to the politics of addition and bringing more people into the, the project of, of improving our society and improving governance and, and getting to work on, on all the key issues that we've talked about, about here. I think we should celebrate, you know, celebrate free speech. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, reminded of uh, Timothy Garton Ash's book, Free Speech, in which he, uh, you know, he's, he said really there are 10 key principles. One of those is diversity, and, and we, need, we need to have that diversity, uh, but, but also we need to have a respectful, I think, uh, a respectful discussion and, and, and also really get at, at some of the substance of, of these problems as we try to do in these, in these episodes. But, um, you know, I, I think that we cannot undervalue the, the degree to which it's important for leaders uh, to to you know to 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 emphasize our commonality, you know, I, Francis Fukuyama, our our our, um, you know, our colleague here at Stanford, he's written this book, Identity, and he just talks about how important it is for even while you celebrate micro identities and and different uh, and 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 uh, different cultures and and ethnic backgrounds and different different aspects of the diversity that that is a strength of of our nation, we have to have also this this broader identity of what it means to be an American. And so I, I think it's important for our leaders to emphasize that uh, and, 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 to, and to maybe use this crisis as a way uh, to, to celebrate that identity and for us to begin to work together more effectively on solutions. Okay, John, and then we'll give Neil the last word. So I think, uh, yeah, um, I think any of us uh, put in charge would do what HR says, possibly without the, the, um, the, the regal bearing. Uh, we would act presidential. We would listen. We would bridge gaps. Uh, we would recognize that all of America recognize the problems, that there are common sol bipartisan solutions sitting there on the table to bring together. I think we would try to de-escalate our politics, brings armed control to it. Um, we would, for example, try to get the, the, uh, the law, the, the criminal justice system out of politics where it is now. We would try to, uh, to try to get the institutions of our civil society back to being bipartisan or nonpartisan rather than everything fighting at each other. Uh, and then the good question is, would we get elected again or would we lose in an absolute landslide? Neil? I want to send uh, uh, listeners and viewers back to uh, Dwight Eisenhower uh, and the extraordinary uh, competence uh, that he brought to the office of president, as well as uh, that that uh, remarkable capacity for what uh, what HR and, and John have been talking about, uh, he was a unifying figure. Uh, after all, his his war service more or less assured him of of that that credibility. And Eisenhower is the kind of president this country desperately needs. Somebody who's who's proven himself in terms of, uh, of, of competence uh, and who can be a, a, a unifying figure. It's interesting how historians have revised their views of Eisenhower. Uh, by the end of his career, it was uh, commonplace for the Harvard types to ridicule him for uh, not working hard enough, not being intellectual enough, playing golf to excess. All of those things were were directed at him, and there was a great appetite for the, the the youthful debonair John F. Kennedy. But historians have, I think, looked back and said that that Ike really was a formidable president who grappled with the challenges of the the nuclear age with a real subtlety, a real understanding of how much of a military industrial complex the United States could really stand and remain a free country. I think we face those same challenges. As I've said, I feel we're in Cold War II and we're at an early stage of it. And, and it's exactly the time when you need an Eisenhower, somebody who understands the nature of the military challenges, but has a feel for how much a free society can really take uh, in a Cold War. So I like Ike and I think everybody should. Okay. Well, let's call it a week at that, gentlemen. Neil, have a good beer. HR, enjoy your wine. John, I tell you what, come for a walk with me. I'll go dry in your honor, my colleague. How's that? Okay. Give him a Manhattan. Okay. <laughs> gentlemen, thank you. I enjoyed the conversation very much. That's it for this episode of Goodfellas. We'll be back a week from now with a new content, whole new conversation. Hopefully the triumvirate will still be intact a week from now. We will see. Stay tuned and find out. On the behalf of my Hoover colleagues, the good fellows, John Cochran, Neil Ferguson, H.R. McMaster, all of us here at the Hoover Institution, 
we wish you and yours the very best in these complicated times. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll do our best here at the Hoover Institution to help you stay informed. See you next week.